nice to be here. Um, I've been working as a neuropsychologist now for about 35 years, and I, just, I was just thinking <clears throat> the other day, about the, in my second year of, of testing, I tested a five-year-old, and I gave him the first, first item on a vocabulary test. Which, can you hear me okay? Which is, what's a cow? And the kid said, I can't believe you don't know that. <laughs> more, more, more recently, um, I, I was testing a, a 13-year-old boy with autism who has that savant ability that if you tell him your birth date, he can tell you what day of the week you were born. And so I, I got to work one day, and the kid was there, and a couple of the younger psychology associates had, had, had tried it out and looked up on the internet, and he was right on. He said, Bill, you got to do it. So I said, I said tell, tell him your birth date. So I said, November 11th, 1949. And the kid thought for a minute, he said, 1940s, I can't go back that far. <laughs> a little humbling, but, but, but interesting nonetheless. So um, I, I, I want to tell you, I have a cold and a cough. I don't have the flu, I'm, I, I'm my fourth day, I'm probably not contagious, but um, I, I do have a cold, and, and if I, I'm, I'm gonna be sucking on Ricolas and uh, drinking water as we go, I think, I think we'll be fine. Um, if, if I trail off at all, just, just raise your hand, let, let me know if you missed something. Um, so, uh, my friend Ned Johnson and I uh, uh, started lecturing together probably seven or eight, seven or eight years ago um, about how, how kids become self-motivated and also about the effects of being chronically stressed and chronically tired on kids' development. And, and a few years ago, um, we, uh, we decided to, to write a book, and our, and our main concerns were how, how many kids that we see are, are by the time that they're you know, seven or eight are diagnosed with anxiety disorders, that, that the huge incidence of anxiety disorders, depression, chemical issues in adolescence. And, and our, our clinical experience was really very similar to what, what, what's re being reported in the literature. Um, and and we, 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 we were concerned about the, this, these stress-related mental health problems that Ann mentioned. And also, the kids that Ned sees, and Ned, Ned's a test prep guy and, and, and works with a lot of really high achieving kids and a lot of high pressure kids, kind of peel them off the wall, whose motivational drive is largely based in fear that they aren't going to get into an elite enough, elite enough college. <coughs> and, and a lot of the work is peeling them off the walls. And where the, it's not a healthy motivation. It's not healthy self-drive. And a lot of kids that I see who have learning issues or ADHD or bad anxiety, they aren't good students that figure, what's the point of trying? And, and so is the is this mental health part and the motivational part that we're really concerned about. And what, what, what occurred to us, and we, we're trying to figure out as, as we wanted to write a book, kind of what, what should be the organizing structure of this book, the organizing theme? At one point, Ned said, I think everything that we think is helpful to kids and their families increases the sense of control. And it, it turns out that this sense of control, uh, what, what it is, it, it, we really think about it as having two aspects. One is the idea of agency or autonomy, that this is my life and, and I can direct my own life. And, and the, the opposite would, would be the feeling helpless, hopeless, passive, impotent, or resigned. And the second is, is not feeling overwhelmed or, or, or not feeling chronically anxious or not, not feeling chronically pressured. And from a neurological point of view, it, 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 what we're talking about is when, when you're in your right mind and the kids you work with are in their right minds, that the prefrontal cortex regulates the amygdala. And, and we, we know that, that, we, that the, the kids who are more resilient have stronger connections between the prefrontal cortex and, and the amygdala. And, and so much of what we want to do in promoting kids' development is helping them develop that, that ability to stay in the brain state where the prefrontal cortex is, is regulating the amygdala, to stay in their right mind so they can think straight and pursue goals and, and experience this healthy sense of control. And a sense of control, that doesn't mean <coughs> being controlling, thinking I'm supposed to control everything. What it means is, is that it's a sense of control. They've done studies where, where uh, that you can be in a hotel room and there's an obnoxious buzzing coming from, from the next room. And you, so somebody from the hotel comes and knocks on the door and says, I'm sorry about that buzzing. Here, here's a little button. If you press the button, it'll attenuate the, 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 the obnoxious buzzing. And whether the, 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 the button is connected to the buzzer at all, just having something to do lowers your stress level. It's a sense of control. And 
we, um, <clears throat> so I'm going to talk for a couple of minutes about what, what a lot of you already know, is about what people are talking about, this epidemic of stress-related mental health problems. And uh, some of you know the name Jean Twenge uh, at San Diego State. Twenge did this brilliant set of studies where she, she looked at college students. And the MMPI, the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, was developed in, in the 1930s. And she compared the responses to the MMPI of, 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 of college-age people in, in uh, like the, the Great Depression, and then 19, 1952 during the World War, World, World War II, Great Depression, um, uh, the Cold War. And what she found was that young people in 2010, college-age kids, were five to eight times more likely to report symptoms of anxiety disorder and depression than they were at the height of the Great Depression during World War II, during the Cold War. And then just a year ago, um, it, well, I'll say this, that the, the last big epidemiological study was done at, at NIMH, NIMH, published in 2010. And what they found was that 30% of girls get diagnosed with an anxiety disorder during adolescence, and 20% of boys, so about half the population. And that was in 2010. And it's worse now. This Twenge just did, published a really interesting paper last year where Twenge studies generational differences and trying to track the difference between Generation X and Millennials and like that. And what she says in, this <coughs> in her article is that just you have to, these, these differences are so subtle and they take so much time, you really have to look very carefully over a long period of time to track them. She says she's never seen anything like what she saw between 2012 and 2017 in terms of the spike in, in adolescent anxiety disorders and depression. And her hypothesis is it's related to, to, to the fact that, that after 2012, more than half the population has a cell phone, and particularly to the, 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 kind of the, um, the effects of social media, particularly on, on girls. In, in Palo Alto, I was just out in, in, in uh, Ned and I were just out in, in uh, Silicon Valley and uh, talking about our book. And in Palo Alto, uh, there, there was a cluster of suicides about three or four years ago. And a, a scientist from St. Louis went into Palo Alto High School and just surveyed the, the kids, uh, gave them the, these mental health surveys. And 80% reported feelings of, of really serious symptoms of anxiety. 54% reported really serious symptoms of, of depression. And <coughs> it's interesting from a sense of control point of view. But when, <coughs> pardon me. <coughs> Recall it. <laughs> um, when people were, well, people were asked, what's going on here? What's going on here in Palo Alto? One of the people who, who, the experts they surveyed said, these kids feel existentially impotent. Another one said, who's a th who sees ther does therapy in Marin County, said, 15 years ago, these kids fought back. Now they don't f fight back. And so th this is, um, and the relation, between, the, the relation between this and the sense of control is this. Um, so so th this, is, this is a concern uh, uh, about the, the very externalizing, low, low sense of control uh, effects of, of social media, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. And so what's the connection with the sense of control? Uh, there, there's a, there's a <clears throat> neuroscientist in Montreal who has said that you can summarize what makes life stressful with the acronym NUTS. And it's novelty, unpredictability, threat, perceived threat, and a low sense of control. And, and, she, and the, the stress scientists say, it's that low sense of control, the most stressful thing. Because you can be in a new situation or an unpredictable situation, even a situation that may be threatening. But if you have a sense, I can handle this. I, got, I, I can call my, my dad to help her. It's, it's, it's just not so stressful. It's that low sense of control that's so stressful. And there's a lot of evidence with animals and also with humans that if you had the experience of being able to have con controlling a stressful situation, of being able to master a stressful situation. It changes your brain in a way that makes you more resilient and, and, and makes you uh, a, an effective coper. St Steve Meyer uh, is one of the great psychologists in the world. He's done this long series of studies with rats. It has them in a cage, the tail's outside the cage. They shock the tail and there's a wheel in, in the cage. And if the rat turns the wheel, the shock will stop. And these rats, these young rats, have the experience that they, they, they start to get shocked. They turn the wheel, and they can stop it. 
And that experience, what happens when they're doing that is that their frontal cortex activates big time. They go into this kind of major coping mode, and, and the frontal cortex regulates down the, the lower stress response system. And they go into coping mode. And then even when they, dis, when they disconnect the wheel from the shocking apparatus, the, 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 these rats continue to do left frontal, they, they get shocked, left frontal activation, they, they turn like crazy, and their stress levels, are, their, their stress homes are much lower. That experience of just having that sense of control is really powerful, both in, in animals and in humans. And, and again, I was, I was just reading, some of you know uh, Richie Davidson's book, The Emotional Life of the Brain? It's a really, really interesting uh, book about human emotion. And he says that, um, <coughs> that the first thing he, stu he really went, the first thing he studied was what makes people resilient, what makes people able to bounce back from stress. And he said, it's, it's two things. It's the degree of activation in your left frontal cortex and the, amount of the, the, the degree to which you have of, of connect, the, the, the strength of the connections between your prefrontal cortex and your amygdala. So that you, you, you want, you, you want the, a, a really healthy connections between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala so that when something stressful happens, you go into that coping mode. And your, your, your prefrontal cortex puts things, puts things in perspective, thinks, what can I do? And you don't get overwhelmed, you don't panic, you, you don't quit. And so th this, this, this is one of our angles in terms of, if, if, if a low sense of control is the most stressful thing in the universe, and these kids today are just plagued by, by stress-related problems, this must be a big deal. This, this sense of control, and, and promoting this sense of control must be a big deal. And it turns out that if, if, you, just, if you do a functional MRI scanning of uh, kids, t teenagers, or adults who have anxiety disorders or depression, the major thing that shows up is a hyperactive amygdala. And that, um, so, yeah. And it turns out that one of our major concerns about this is, is that if a kid gets, gets an anxiety disorder, or a kid get, gets depressed, it changes the brain. People have been saying for 20 years that depression, that depression scars the brain, meaning that it changes in a way that makes it more likely that, that you're going you're to have depression again and again. And the same with anxiety disorders, because what happens is from an epigenetic uh, point of view, is that the genes, the genes that, that are supposed to turn off the, the, the stress response can get locked in the on position, and, and so they, it just, the stress response just, just continues. And so it struck me years ago that, that, that when, when the neuroscientists started saying that adolescents are sculpting their adult brain, it occurred to me, I, I don't want adolescents to be sculpting brains that are chronically stressed. They're, they're, they're chronic, chronically anxious because it just makes it more, much more likely that they'll be experiencing kind of recurrent anxiety or depression as they get older. And the, so from our point of view, from, from Ned's and my point of view, the most important outcome of, of a kid's adolescence, it's not where they go to college, it's, the, it's the, the, is having a healthy brain. Having a brain that's, 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 that has high stress tolerance, that, that functions well in stressful situations, and, and doesn't have chronically high levels of stress hormones. And we, 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 we talk to so many groups of, of, of educators and parents in schools where the really high achieving kids where there's so much depression, so much anxiety. And, and our, our angle is we want kids to be successful, but we want them to enjoy our, their success. And we see so many in, in the D.C. area where we live, we see so many extremely wealthy, extremely successful people who are friggin' miserable. And, and I think that, that they just don't enjoy their success. And we want kids to be able to, to be successful and to be able to enjoy their success. And just in terms of, this is an illustration you probably experienced in Chicago land here. Uh, <laughs> in, in Northern Virginia, we're, we're close to where we live, it's, it's probably worse, but. Um, and, and just, just for, for whatever it's worth, just looking at nature um, lowers your stress hormones. And let's just say br briefly, a Amy Arnston, who is one of the top stress scientists in the world, says that the prefrontal cortex is the Goldilocks of the brain. And what she means is that the, the, the prefrontal cortex is, is really run by the neurotransmitters dopamine and norepinephrine, and they have to be in really delicate balance to, to function well. 
And you think about how easily your attention, if, 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 if your boss says, I, I need to see you at three o'clock today, that how hard it is to concentrate on anything else because th that your prefrontal cortex, it, th that stress can, can, can stress can throw off that balance between norepinephrine and, and dopamine so easily that it's, hard, that it's hard to focus and it's hard to put things in perspective. <clears throat> and so from a learning point of view, Ned, Ned tells this story uh, of, of Ned is an SAT, uh, he's a uh, prep guy, and he does all, all the, the, uh, the tests, and he's, he's brilliant at it. And he's, he, uh, when he was 28, he uh, started taking the SAT, and he still takes it every year in, in, in the ACT. And he was, he was sitting with a bunch of, of high school seniors or juniors <laughs> ready to take the test the first time. And he noticed that his heart beats 140 beats a minute. And he'd been, try, he'd been trying to figure out why, why do so many kids who he trains, who he prepares for a test, do great on the, on the practice test, and then bomb on when they go to take it. And, and he started reading about the, stress of, the effects of stress on, on performance. And, and um, <clears throat> you know the, some of you, you know the, the, the Yerkes Dodson law, which is basically that, that the more you need a certain level of arousal or, or, or cortisol, really, to get focused and get energized for optimal performance. When you have too much, your performance starts to go downhill. And what, so what Ned has done in his work is, is try to, with these really high achieving kids, is try to peel them off the wall, try to, try to lower their stress hormones by, by having them sleep, having, putting things in perspective, because optimal performance doesn't come from being over the top in terms of being stressed. And I'll just say also that, that, that some of the families that we work with, they have the idea that if kids aren't pushed all the time, they won't meet their full potential, which is just, the opposite of what's true. The kids don't need to be pushed all the time to reach their full potential. Now, um, this motivational piece uh, is interesting because it, it turns out that every, everywhere we looked in terms of understanding how do kids become self-motivated, all the arrows pointed toward autonomy. So how, how many of you know the self-determination theory? Anybody? So uh, we, I, I think this is one of the, the, the it's, it's one of the most useful and certainly one of the best supported theories in psychology, and it holds that to be internally motivated, intrinsically motivated, you have to have three things: you have to have a sense of competence, you have to have a sense of relatedness, a connectedness to people, and you have to have a sense of autonomy. And we, we a couple of years ago when we were working on the book, we called uh, Edward D.C., one of the guys who, who developed self-determination theory. And, and we said, from our experience, in terms of development of motivation, it seems like autonomy is the most important of these three. And he said, absolutely, that's right. And it, where we live, there's, it, <clears throat> there's so much emphasis on competence, on, on kids being good at things and, and, and doing well in school and doing well in sports that, that interferes, often in, in a way that interferes with the development of relatedness and the development of a sense of, 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 of autonomy. And, we, we, we really like this idea a lot of the, the self-determination theory. I, I find in my own work with clients, with, with families, just here's what we're trying to promote, this strong sense of connectedness, this build competence, and a sense of autonomy. And so many of the kids that I work with, we have the idea that when kids are, are not doing well, our first urge is to clamp down on them, when actually many, many is the, the, first, the first thing we need to do is, is to support autonomy. There's this extensive, extensive research on the, the benefits that, that in schools and in homes where, where we promote autonomy in young people, it's a big deal. And we also, um, some of you know, how many of you know growth mindset? So Carol Dweck, and so the way I think about it, Carol, I've been reading Carol Dweck since the 1986 when she was talking about kids who had adaptive versus maladaptive motivational patterns. <laughs> and um, so the, the way we see this growth mindset, which is that the idea that, that, I, that I, I'm, I get better by, by working at stuff and working hard at stuff, um, it's, it's a sense of control, right? I mean, the, 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 the fixed mindset, which is basically I'm born with a certain amount of ability and there's not much I can do about it, is kind of, it, it, is that low sense of control, that, that low, that external sense of control, that, that growth mindset is, is a sense of control, it reflects a high sense, a healthy sense of control. So again, everywhere we looked, we saw that this emphasis on autonomy um, is related to motivation. And 
the, the third, the thir well, uh, there's, there's one more thing. The, the third thing that we've looked at is, is flow theory, that, that, the, the, that experience of being passionately involved in something so that you are fully committed, you're fully in the present, you're working hard at something, but it's not so hard that it's stressful. And people have this in, in music or art and sports and sex and various things where you're completely engaged. And, and there's, a, there's a researcher who studies adolescent development by the name of Reed Larson. And it's, it's 20 years ago or so, Reed was studying how do kids turn into self-motivated adolescents and, and adults. And he concluded that it wasn't through dutifully doing their homework. It was through passionate pursuit of pastimes, of, of, of art or music or, or, or dance or, or, or rope, rock climbing, whatever they're really passionate about, that, that's, what, that's what developed it, uh, this kind of, this self-driven kind of internal motivation. And when I learned about this, it, this, this made sense to me because uh, in high school, I, I, I graduated with a 2.8 grade point average, and at that time, you only needed a 2.5 to get into the University of Washington. I, st I still kick myself for kind of having overachieved and spent all that extra, <laughs> yeah, but, but if, you know, but, I, I, but I, I, um, I don't remember ever finishing a book in high school. I don't remember turning anything on time. It was just, it just wasn't a big priority for me. But I was a passionate rock and roll guy. I was, a rock and roll, rock and, I was in a rock and roll band. And I had a room with, with, with electric organ and a guitar. And every night I'd tell myself, I'll go and, and, and practice for half an hour, and then I'll do some homework. And every night I, I, I'd come out of my music room after two and a half hours and have no idea what time it is. And, and if I spent two and a half hours almost every night in a brain state that, that, that <clears throat> involved high concentration, high focus, high effort, high determination, low threat, low, low, uh, low stress. And that's, a that, that's that, that flow state where you're completely engaged, you're completely in the moment, you're using all your effort, all your energy, but it's not stressful. That's the ideal brain, from my point of view, the ideal brain state to be in most of the time in adult life. And, and, and I, when this idea that adolescents are sculpting their adult brain, it just seemed to me, as, when, I, when I started reading Reed Larson, it made sense to me because I really felt like I sculpted a brain in high school that once I found something I wanted to study, I, I could go pedal to the metal. Um, so uh, this is, uh, and I will say one last thing. There's a chapter in our book about kids with ADHD, LD, and, and autism. And the, the particular challenges kids have if they have one of these three or, or, or some combination of them for developing the sense of control. And, and uh, what I, I found in study of autism, uh, I found one study on the pro promotion of autonomy. And there's, there's hardly anything that with kids with ADHD. There's a couple studies on learning disabilities. And it turns out you can't become independent if you don't have a sense of autonomy. You can't become independent if you don't have a sense that this is my life and I'm going to get out of it what I, work, what I put into it. And so I think we need a lot more, lot more focus now on, on there's actually, a, there's actually a, a therapeutic program for kids with ADHD that this, that's focused on developing autonomy um, that, that we mentioned in our book. Um, but there's very little with, with autism. Uh, but it, it, the, from our point of view, the sense of control is a really powerful construct. And just in the last two years that Ned and I have been working on a book and talking about it, just our clinical experience is such, such that almost everything it, is, it gets better if we can support this sense of autonomy or control. So that, that's the basic idea of, of what our books, have, why we wrote this book. Um, and let, let me tell you some of the stuff that, that's in the book and to, that we recommend to, to kids and, and, and educators. And the first thing, well, first I'll tell you this, that for the, probably the first 13 or 14 years of my career, I, I did uh, a lot of therapy as, as well as neuropsychological testing. And, <clears throat> And I had experiences like this. I, I, I'd, um, I do a lot of work with uh, underachievers, and I did that. And I'd see those underachievers, and, and so I, I'd ask them, I'd say, if you, don't turn in this, if you don't turn in an assignment, who's most upset? And invariably, the kid would say, my mom. Then, then using a fairly family therapy technique, I'd say, who's next most upset? My dad. Who's next, who's next most upset? My teacher. Who's next most upset? You know, my therapist, my, you know, my, my, my tutor. You know, and I was just so struck by the fact, never was the kid on the list. 
You know, and, and, and it, what struck me was that, uh, and I just think you'll, you'll find that if, if, if adults spend 80 units of energy trying to solve a kid's problem, the kid will spend 20. And if the adults get more anxious and spend 90, the kid will spend 10. In my experience, it doesn't change until the energy changes. And I was, I was, just, in a, I was just in a school meeting uh, recently, uh, talk, talking with, with um, <coughs> a public school, and, the, and the, the, the speech and language therapist was saying that she'd been working with a kid for five years on his articulation, and, he's, and he's, he's fought her tooth and nail for five years. And I says, does it feel like you work a lot harder than he does to, to, for him to help him? He says, absolutely. And I, said, and I said, you're in a tricky position being in a public school because your, your job is to help this kid. But, but we aren't doing him any favors because we're going to weaken him if we work harder than he does. And one of the things that happened when I was doing therapy, one of my friends was trained in a certain kinds of problem-solving psychotherapy where they are told, don't work harder to help your clients solve their problems than they do because you're going to weaken them because they're going to become dependent on you. And, and over the last 20, 25 years, I, I've probably trained, I've trained hundreds of tutors to work with kids with learning disabilities. And I tell them, tell your, if, if it feels to you like you're working harder to help your, your, client, your client, tell him, something's wrong with this picture because I feel like I'm working harder than you are. And, I'm not, and if I work harder than you are, I'm going to weaken you because you're going to think that somebody other than you is responsible for developing your reading skills, your math skills, or whatever it was. And so <clears throat> with this perspective, one of the things that also, that, that early in my career, I, I was struck by was how many parents would say, God, I, I hate dinner time, because after dinner, it's, it's two hours of, of, of World War III fighting about a kid's homework. And I also, I wrote a couple of papers in 1986, and I learned for the first time that, that, that homework doesn't contribute to learning in elementary school. <laughs> and um, so I, I, I wonder, what's all this fighting about? You know, what, what, what's the purpose of it? It doesn't contribute to learning. Why all this fighting? And so I, I wrote a couple papers ab about homework, and one of them was just was an article just how not to fight about it that got reprinted in McCall's magazine of all places. But, but um, um, and what I said is that the, 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 it, 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 this is the title of, of the second chapter in our book was just tell your kid I love you too much to fight with you about your homework. And part of the message is, I, is that you're the most precious thing in the universe to me. Why would I fight with you every night about this, this stupid stuff? And the part, but the next thing you say is, is that I'm willing to do anything I can to help you. I'm willing to be your homework consultant. I'm, I'm willing to, to set my consulting hours from 6.30 to 7.30 and, and help you every night. If you need a tutor, I'll try to get you a tutor. But I'm not willing to act like it's my job. I'm not willing to chase around the house and fight with you and have all this conflict. I'm not willing to act like somehow I'm responsible to get this work done. I mean, obviously, I couldn't be responsible. All you have to do is lay on the floor. I, could, I couldn't get you to do the work. And, and what, what we found is that when parents do that, when they say that, that, that I'll be your consultant, but I'm not going to be your boss and your, or your, your manager, that it, it transforms family. When you change the energy in that way, it transforms families. <laughs> now, one, one of my clients was, was reading our book uh, a couple months ago and sent me this email and said, I just told my eighth grade son, I love you too much to fight with you about your homework. And first he smiled, and then he hugged me, and then he said, is something wrong with you, Mom? <laughs> Apparently, it's a little, little different than the normal uh, discourse they have in the evening. Um, yeah, so, um, so but part of the implications of this idea for, for parents of, 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 of um, thinking about themselves more as consultants than the, 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 the kid's boss or manager is that, um, is that we offer help. We offer to help. We don't try to force it down a kid's throat. We, we offer advice, and just the, 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 it, it, it's so powerful. What we, we, we experience is that if we're talking with a kid and, and uh, kids telling about a problem, we say things like, is that something you'd like help with? Is that something you'd like to be different? Would you like to hear my, I, I got an angle on that. Would, would you like to hear it? So many kids I see are, are very negative about themselves. They think they're stupid. And, and what I say to them, is I'm not, I can't, I'm not going to try to take that away from you. I couldn't take that away from you. But I see it really differently. Would you like to hear, hear, how, hear my angle on it? And I'm just, we're constantly seeking buy-in, in, in part because just from, from a stress response, we, 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 we want that engagement of the prefrontal cortex. And when, when kids feel forced, the amygdala sense that it, 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 it triggers that low sense of control. The amygdala uh, gets fired up and, and shuts down the prefrontal cortex. And so 
Um, we're, we're constantly looking for ways to, to buy, to be, that are respectful to kids be, so that we offer help, we offer advice. I mean, one of my colleagues moved to Florida a few years ago and sent me a postcard that said, I want to give you some advice that my mother gave me, because I sure as hell won't be using it. You know, <laughs> and, you know, and, you know I, I, was, I was lecturing about the, our book in Upper State New York um, a few months ago, and this, when we're, I was talking about this consultant idea and about the, that offering help, and this woman turned to the audience and, and said, you know, that I've been reading this book, and it's changed my relationship with my daughter. She's in a boarding school, and we talk on the phone like it, every uh, two or three weeks, or about two, two or three times a week. And she, it, it always ends up in an argument, because she'll bring up some problem, and I say, well, you should do this, or do that. I, I tell her how to solve it, and she fights back. And, and so I th said a couple weeks ago, she called and she told me a problem. And I said, is there, a way I could, is there a way I could help you with that? She said, and it just completely changed the energy in our relationship. And so uh, again, the sense of control is, is a big deal. And this, this idea of, you know, part, of the, part of our premise in the book is you really can't make a kid do anything against their will. You can't make a kid want what he doesn't want. You can't make him not want what he, what, what he, what, what he wants. And that, that thinking about that, that this energy, that not trying to force stuff on kids, looking for buy-in, is, is a big deal. And we also, part of this consultant idea also, is we want kids to solve their own problems. And we all know about, about helicopter parents. Some of you know the, the phrase bulldozer parents? who may, may try, try to remove all obstacles. I, I, I was interviewed about the book from a, um, a writer in the Netherlands who says in the Netherlands they call it curling. Parenting, you know, you know the, the, the Olympics where you're sweeping the ice out of the way. <laughs> and so, um, so we, we want kids to solve, and, and I, I used to do this exercise where I'd make up these scenarios. Uh, for, for, you know, a, a third grade girl comes home and she was the only kid in her class not invited to a birthday party or the only, and, and only in her friend group, and, and, or a kid you know, uh, comes home and just broke up with his girlfriend is really upset. And what we ask the parents, the first question we ask the parents to, to consider is, whose problem is it? And because it's so, as, as parents, it's just so, it's so easy for, for us to launch into to, to, to pro solving the, the problems for the kid. And it, based on this research that I was talking about earlier, that if, when you have the experience of solving a problem, you have the experience of coping with something stressful, that changes your brain in a way that you, when, when something stressful happens, you go into coping mode. And we want that, but we, it's not like we want kids to, to never have any stress in their life. You don't become resilient if you don't ex experience stressful stuff. But we want kids as much as possible with support as necessary to manage stressful situations because that's what builds resiliency in the brain. That's what makes kids uh, able to, to cope with stuff. And even, even, even if, if something really, really very painful happens, I, <laughs> one, one of the tutors I trained a few years ago uh, told me a story about one of, one, one of her, um, cl her clients who's in second grade. And, the, teach and um, the kid came over from school one day and apparently was in a real bad mood. And, and the mother said, honey, what happened? She said, well, the kid said, well, the teacher today, she, she said, what's the biggest number in the world? And I, and I said, 23,000. And the teacher said, well, what about 23,001? 23, and the girl said, I was so close. <laughs> <coughs> so, um, okay, so the, yeah, that, that's, that's the, okay. So that's the base. That's, that's chapter two. I'm not going to go through all 14 chapters. Um, the the, th the third chapter <laughs> uh, is is on um, it's on decision. It's called "It's Your Call," and the idea is that um, uh, early in my career, um, in the first several years, it was it was much more common than it is now for for kids to be uh, to be to be required asked to repeat a grade, particularly kindergarten and first grade, um, in the public schools. And what I, what I saw was, I, I was struck by how often I would see a 20-year-old for testing. And I'd say, so what, where are you in school? And the, and the kid would say, I, I'm, a, I'm a, a freshman in college. I should be a sophomore, but my parents made me repeat the first grade. You know, they're still pissed about it after, you know, after, all, after all those years, you know. And it just seemed to me that, that, that we, we could do that little nuts. So what I started to do, and this may seem nuts to you, but what I started to do was, was I told the parents, you know, the school really can't make your kid repeat the, the first grade. Let's tell the kid, 
Nobody's going to make you repeat the grade. However, let, let's think through the pros and cons. And you, you get to decide. It'll be your call. But let's think through the pros and cons. And I'd see seven-year-olds think all, think all summer about should, should I repeat or not. And they, they talk with their parents. They'd ask, they'd ask their people. And they, they come to a conclusion at the end of the summer. They say, I think I'm ready to go. And if, if kids tease me, if, if I need a tutor, can I get a tutor? Or some kids would say, I, I know I need to stay back. If kids te te tease me about, you, you're stupid or you're flunked, I can handle that. And I was just so struck by young people. These young kids could make good, good decisions for themselves as, as, as adults could make for them. And so I, I, I placed a real heavy emphasis in my work on supporting kids in making decisions. And over the course of my career, I've, I felt that the best message you can give a teenager is that I have confidence in your ability to make decisions about your own life and to learn from your mistakes. And I want you to have a lot of practice doing that before I send you off to college. And I think that, that certainly there's, um, can you read the, read the caption at the bottom of this cartoon? It, it's, we've been thinking a lot about what we want to do with your life. Um, and uh, it, <laughs> we see a lot of that. But you know, th th our basic premise is that kids want their life to work. You know, kids, kids want to be successful. They, they, want to have a, they want to have a successful life. And as, as, long, as, as, as long as we help them, as, as long as th they're helped to make informed decisions, Kids can make very good decisions about their own life. And it turns out that, that most of the cognitive processes re that were related to making decision making are pretty mature by the time you're 14 or 15. And it's also true that, <clears throat> as many of you know, that, that emotions are hugely related to good decision making. In the sense that, I mean, if, if, if you have damage to emotional centers in your brain, you can't decide what to have for breakfast. I mean, the, the, because decision making is rooted in what do I want? What would feel good? What would, how, how would this affect my friends? How would this affect my family? That you have to be able to access emotions. And I want kids to be accessing their own emotions, as well as thinking the, the, the cognitive pros and cons in making decisions. My experience has been that when you tell a kid, this is going to be your decision, nobody's going to force you to do something else, that they're ruthlessly honest with themselves, they ask for help, that they, they want input, because they want their lives to work. And, and I, I think that... Um, that but, but it, it's so empowering to kids when we do this. And part of the reason that, that I, I, I feel so strongly about this is that we don't really always know, or maybe we rarely know, what's in a kid's best interest. In, in the sense that, that we don't know who a kid is gonna, ultimately going to want to be, right? And also, when you're evaluating a decision, whether it was good or bad, do you wait a month? Do you wait six months? Do you wait a year? to wait five years. The first time I went to graduate school, I, I was in a PhD program in English literature at Berkeley, and I went, for 20, I went for two quarters, 20 weeks, and I was so anxious and insecure, I didn't turn in a single assignment. So I, I flunked out at the, at the and When I work with underachievers now, I tell them the story. I said, 20 weeks, nothing, top that. <laughs> I, I set the bar high you know, in terms of underachievement. But, uh, but, um, but, it took me about um, two months to realize it was the best thing that could have possibly happened. When, when it first happened, I felt, I felt devastated. I felt my whole life was gone about smoke. It took me about two months to realize I, I wasn't cut out to be an English professor. And I actually ran into the, the guy, the one guy flunked me. Everybody else gave me an incomplete. One professor at the second quarter flunked me. And I, I actually ran into him on the campus of the University of Washington two years later, and I, I shook his hand and thanked him for flunking me. I said, it was the best possible thing that could have happened. So but, but that's part of the reason that I want kids to pay attention to what's important to them and, and, and make, their, make their own decisions. Ned and I have an article uh, coming out in the New York Times, I, th I think a week from today, on the, the number of kids that we see who go off to college and, and are, are come back home by, by November 1st. And I, I, it's at least six of my clients were, were started the freshman year and were back home by mid-October. Mid and that doesn't count the kids who started their sophomore year and back, were back home by October. And part of, part of our argument is kids have so little practice running their own lives, and you send them into this very dysregulated learning environment, uh, living environment, uh, and th that kids need a lot of practice making decisions and, and running their own lives. Now, the, the fourth chapter in our book, it's, it's called a non-anxious presence. And I, I wish I did, but I didn't make up this term. Um, 
A guy by the name of Edwin Friedman uh, was a rabbi and a, and, a, and a consultant and a systems thinker, and he, he studied organizations, and he consulted in, in churches and synagogues and schools and corporations, and he, his idea was that all organizations, from a family to a corporation, they work best if the leaders are not chronically anxious and, and emotionally reactive. And you think about it, I mean, if you've got an infant who, who's upset, it's, it's much easier to soothe an infant if you stay calm. If you have a two-year-old in a store who's having a tantrum, it's much easier to deal with it if you stay calm. You've got a 15-year-old who comes home from school, I've just, just flunked a test, or his girlfriend just broke up with him. It's a lot easier to be, be, be helpful if we stay calm. And so in, in this chapter, we, we talk about the, the research on stress contagion, you know, that uh, kids, in, kids in school, if they have a burned out teacher, have higher cortisol levels, higher stress hormone levels than kids who don't have a burned out teacher. You, you, you give them a mother with an infant something very stressful to do, the infant's cortisol levels go up along with the mother's. And it's, calm is contagious as well, uh, but, but it turns out that so many of the kids that we see who have a lot of anxiety, have very anxious parents, and it never occurs to the parents that one of the ways that they could help their kids the most is, is lowering their own anxiety. And so in this chapter, we, we talk about the idea of ideally, home is a safe base. I mean, they, like, life, you know, life is stressful enough. And, and some of the kids we see, they go home and, and there's all this stress and pressure and, and, and a lot of tension at home, uh, a lot of it related to homework um, or, or, or fighting over the use of technology. And we, we, we go back to basic research. Some of you know the, the, the work of Michael Meany. Uh, Michael Meany is one of the great psychologists in the world. And he did this, these studies where he, um, he separated rat pups for, for, for 15 minutes a day for the first two weeks of their life from their mother and then returned them. And the experience of being separated was extremely stressful for the rat pups. And then what, what would happen when they, when they returned to the mother that the mother would lick and groom them for a long time. And basically the cortisol levels would, be, it would start out really high and, and it would drop dramatically. And this, so this went on for two weeks, having this experience of being extremely stressed and fully recovering with, with, with the licking and grooming. And it t turns out that, after, that these, these, uh, these rats who had this experience, as adults, Muni's group called them California laid back rats because they were almost impossible to stress because they had that experience of being able to, 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 to stressful, something stressful happens, fully recovering. And, 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 and at some level, their, their brain knew, I can handle this stuff, because it, it gets better. And I was just reading about, uh, just re reading a book about uh, kids who have, uh, who have tr a lot of trauma early on. And, and w one of the th things, the points they make, is that when infants come into this world, what they, what, they, what they need is warmth and responsiveness. They don't respond to discipline. They don't respond to, 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 to consequences. They need warmth and responsiveness. And part of, part of our, the, 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 the approach, part of what we emphasize in this fourth chapter of our book is that I, I can't think of any age where we don't benefit from warmth and responsiveness. And so part, part of what we suggest to parents is, is taking a long view in the sense that um, it struck me when I used to do therapy that all, all, the, all the parents' anxiety about their kid was, was in the future. It's about the future. It was about the idea that somehow they're going to get stuck in some ne negative place and not get out of it. And so I mean, the idea would be that if I had a crystal ball and I could tell you, even though if your kid is really screwed up right now, he's going to be okay. You wouldn't worry about it. You think, okay, this, this is just part of his path. If, if you tell me about your kid's problem, and I, seen, I, I, and I said, I've seen 5,000 kids like this, and they've all done okay. You wouldn't worry about it. And so to helping kids, helping parents understand this, the very protracted develop, uh, maturation of the prefrontal cortex, how kids can be so different when they're 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 35, is really helpful. We also place an emphasis on just enjoying your kid. When I used to do psychotherapy, and I'd, I'd, I'd work with families where there's a lot of conflict between the parents and the kid, I'd, I'd say, let's set our first goal as simply enjoying the kid. So the kid experiences himself as a joy-producing organism, as opposed to a frustration-producing organism, and let, let, let's go from there. 
and let's work backwards and remove the, the, the impediments to enjoying the kid. And so we, we have a lot of suggestions in terms of practicing acceptance of a kid, where a kid is right now, being in the present with a kid uh, in this chapter. But I, th I think that there's, um, it's counterintuitive to parents that, 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 that one of the best ways they can help is man better managing their own anxiety. I, I've, I've struck, over the years, I've sat with many families who've, who've told me about their kids' problems, and then one of the parents will break into tears. And, w w they, and they'll say, I just want him to feel good about himself. And when they stop crying, I say, I think we can more convincingly help him feel good about himself if we aren't worried sick. And so we just ch we work on changing the thinking, changing the feeling, um, so that we can be more of a non-anxious um, presence. And, and also, I, I point out that, that there's a very interesting research by uh, a woman by the name of Gilda Ginsburg who has uh, worked with families where the, where the parents have social anxiety disorders. And the kids are, are, are much more likely to develop anxiety disorders than kids whose parents aren't, aren't particularly anxious. She's done an intervention that, that, that focuses on the family intervention for like, like eight, ten weeks that significantly reduces the, the, the risk of kids developing anxiety disorders in the next year. And the, the idea <coughs> is that, um, is that but part of it is the stress contagion. When, when, we all, when we're, all of us are less anxious, we infect each other less with anxiety. And part of it is that we, we, really anxious parents are much less likely, to, they're much more likely to be critical of their kid, and they're much less likely to promote autonomy. They're much more likely to be controlling. I mean, you think about it. I mean, one, one, one of the reasons that we see f parents who are constantly nagging their kids, even though, even though that it's not, you know it's not the right thing to do, they're constantly on them because that's, they, they do that to minimize their own loss, to, to heighten their own sense of control. I got to do something. And even though it doesn't work, at least I'm doing something. So I don't experience that, that, that terrible low sense of control. And kids, my experience is that kids who procrastinate, kids who don't, a lot of underachievers, they let their parents worry about their work. It's kind of, <laughs> you know, like this, this, um, this, this it's, it's not uh, who's the most upset kind of idea. Kids manage their anxiety by letting parents worry about their problems. Um, and so and if we can change that energy, th things can get better. Uh, what, what time is it? Five to um, There's a couple of chapters in the book um, <coughs> about what we call radical downtime. And uh, the, the idea is that life is so stressful these days that, and, and it's so fast-paced, and kids are, that this 24, 7 uh, connection, technologically, that we need radical downtime. And radical downtime, in our minds, is doing nothing. We're just looking at doing nothing. And the three things that are included in radical downtime are, are daydreaming, or mind-wandering, meditation, and sleep. And I showed the, the slide of the default mode network because <clears throat> How many of you know the fault mode? The, the very the part of the brain that really just figured out that this, this network in the brain that only activates, it was just discovered in around 2000, only activates when you aren't focused on a task. And it turns out that if you're, if you're just sitting uh, in a waiting room and you don't have your phone or, or, and you don't read a magazine, you, you think about yourself, you think about your past or your future, or you think about your friends, your relationships. And a lot of concern is being expressed these days that young people don't have enough time to simply reflect on themselves. And so that because, because there's so much evidence that, that kids benefit from, time, from <laughs> that, that, that daydreaming or mind wandering is so important for problem solving, for creativity, for the sense of um, a coherent sense of identity, being able to reflect on yourself, and the development of empathy. That, that part of the book we talk about letting kids be bored, having periods where they don't have anything to do, and they can reflect on themselves. And <coughs> we also talk about um, meditation, and um, both Ned and I practice transcendental meditation, um, and I've done <coughs> a lot of work with, with school programs that where, where kids practice TM in schools. We talk about mindfulness, in, our, in our, this chapter, we talk about mindfulness as well. I just know less about it. Um, and I've done a couple studies on, on uh, ADHD kids w w uh, who practice uh, TM in school and have gotten very good results. And, and uh, the first study, uh, we, we got good data, but we also interviewed the kids at the end of the study, these middle school kids. 
And um, what they all said, uh, you know, after meditating for three months in school twice a day for 15 minutes, that I, I'm, I'm much less anxious, a bit, huge drop in anxiety. And um, most of them said, I, I can organize myself better, I can do my homework more independently. And one of them said, um, this, this kid who was wildly impulsive, said, before I started meditating, if I was walking in the hall and somebody bumped me, I'd just turn around and hit him. Now that, but now that I've been meditating, if I'm walking in the hall and somebody bumps me, I stop and think, should I hit him or not? <laughs> Which we thought, that, that, that was huge improvement, you know, huge improvement in impulse control, you know. And um, there, there's another kid who was, who was, who was in, the, that, who was in the, the control group who actually he left the school before the control group was, was taught, would learn TM. But he actually learned it when he was 19. But, but when, he, when, um, when he was like 14, when we did the study, his, his impulsivity manifested in part as just talking really loud. And he used to come to my office for a, a year to see a neurofeedback therapist, and then who started her own practice. And I could always tell that when the kid was, was, in, was in our suite because he just talked so loud. So apparently, the, this, this, the, the, the therapist uh, rented space from a psychologist who doesn't work with kids and apparently doesn't like kids very much. So this kid, this kid with a loud voice goes in the, the first time to this new office. He's talking real loud in the waiting room. And the psychologist comes out and says, when you come here, you're going to have to be quiet. And the kid said, if I could be quiet, I wouldn't have to be here. <laughs> you know, and then, so, um, and, and, and we, we talk, a, we have a whole chapter uh, of, of this third aspect of radical downtime, which is sleep. And arguably, there's nothing more important for, for the brain's development than sleep. And we, we talk about things like the fact that if you, if you aren't well rested, the amygdala is 60% more reactive, we talk about things like if, if you don't get enough sleep, it weakens the connections between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala. We talk about stuff like if you don't get enough sleep, you, you remember negative stuff more than positive stuff. We talk about the fact that, that REM sleep, that REM sleep, dream sleep, seems to be the only time during the day or the 24-hour cycle that your brain is based, virtually devoid of stress uh, hormones. And, and, and the thought now, uh, the, the guy who's been studying this, Matthew Walker, calls REM sleep the, the, uh, the, the overnight therapy. The idea is but we're playing emotional memories, we're playing experiences uh, in a chemically stress-free environment, suggesting this is why sleep heals emotions. So we talk about stuff like that, and, and, and both in, in this chapter and the technology chapter, we talk a lot about collaborative problem solving as, as a means of supporting autonomy in kids, not trying to force, but also being, parents being assertive and, and being able to, to set some limits and, and find ways that we can all live together and support each other. Um, with sleep, you can't make a kid sleep, right? And, and so this, and um, we talk about ways to negotiate with kids uh, about bedtime and, and, and in a way that we can live with and that they can live with. And the, the last two chapters in our book are about what we consider to be, uh, at least in, in many parts of this country, the delusional view that many kids grow up, grow up with in, ter in terms of what it takes to be successful in this world and what success feels like. And I, I, I gave a lecture to a, an AP uh, English class, uh, 11th grade English class a few years ago, at, at one of the, 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 <clears throat> the high, most high achieving uh, high schools in, in our area. And the kids were, were, were dutiful, they, they listened, they asked questions, I was talking about stress and sleep deprivation. And the teacher came up and whispered in my ear afterwards, she said, these kids all think it's either Yale or McDonald's. And they all have the idea that if you don't, do, go, to, go, don't go to a Tech College, you know, you're gonna have a C plus life. And I think that um, we, we have the chapter called um, Who's Ready for College? Where we talk about what this, this really, how, how dysregulated college learning, particularly college dormitories, college lifestyles are, and how hard, how hard they are from a brain point of view, and, and how we, we want kids to be ready to be able to manage the, the, these, these, uh, these, mental, these, these environments because the mental health problems in college are, are, are simply off the charts. And, we, and so many of the families we work with have the idea that if my kid has to get depressed or get, gets anxious or is, is, up, is, is sleep deprived for, for four years, if they get into elite college, it's worth it. And for our point of view, it just ain't worth it. We think the most, the most important outcome, again, of, of, of adolescence is a healthy brain, a brain that kids will want for the rest of their lives. And um, so 
uh, th that we, we also have, a ch so we have this chapter on who's ready for college in terms of partly preparing kids for college and also determining a lot of kids we see who go off to college who simply never should have, they, they weren't ready. They weren't ready. They, they showed no signs of ability to run their own life. And that, that our, our, our advice is you tell your kid, I want you to make sure that you can run your own life successfully for six months before I send you off to college. And so few kids have, have that kind of experience. And, and the last chapter, it's called Alternate Roots. And it's about people who become successful in this world who weren't good students, or maybe they never went to college, or they, they, um, they, they failed their way into to be becoming successful. And, and that, what I find is that when we tell kids, we tell kids these stories about people who, <clears throat> who found success in ways that we didn't anticipate, or ways we never thought about that it's inspiring to them. It's inspiring to, to, to even the high achieving kids. And so um, we want kids to have an accurate model of reality. And in, in fact, if, if, if what they grow up with, grow up with is that if you, aren't, if you aren't in the top 10% of your class, you'll never make anything out of yourself, which is complete and utter nonsense that it, 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 it's, it makes the top 10, <laughs> kids in the top 10%, it makes them kind of crazy. And it makes the other 90% completely discouraged. So we think that having an accurate model of reality is useful. I, I wrote a paper uh, um, or an article in, in Time Magazine a few months ago. Just, the idea was, why don't we just tell kids the truth? Tell them there's advantages to going to elite colleges, but, but it's not necessary. It's not ne completely unnecessary. They have a really uh, good life. It doesn't seem to make much difference where you go to college in terms of how successful you are financially or career-wise, how happy you are through your life. Why don't we just tell them the truth and, and, and have kids focus on, I want you to develop yourself. I want you to develop yourself so you have something useful to offer this world. I want you to so you make some contribution to this world uh, as, as opposed to um, the, the way that we uh, <coughs> typically prepare them. And so I, <laughs> I'll say, tell you that a couple, about six months ago, I tested this girl who's, uh, who is a second grader. She was eight years old. And as part of my interview, I said, is there stuff you worry about? And she said, well, I'm a little worried about my grades. I know my grades will count for college. And I want to go to a good college, like American University, because they have an elevation burger, and I love their fries. <laughs> so, so I started out a little bit worried about the second grader. I, 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 I shifted what she explained her reasoning about college. But, but uh, so in any case, um, we, we end the book by, 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 uh, by saying that um, we, 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 quoting, a, a, I guess, what's attributed to Maya Angelou, the, the idea that, that kids will forget most of what we say to them and most of what we do for them, but they remember how we make them feel. And the idea is that we want kids, we want to feel safe, we want them to feel loved, we want them to feel trusted, we want them to feel supported, and we want them to feel that they're capable of running their own lives. And um, so I'd be happy to uh, take questions.